we are moving on to the second session that is One Health Future Perspective. For this, we have Dr. Anish T.S., uh, the epidemiologist and public health expert from Kerala. He is a well-known faculty who need not want an introduction. He is presently an additional professor, Department of Community Medicine from Manjeri Medical College, Malapuram. He is expertised in infectious disease epidemiology, geohealth, climate change and health-related disorders, also in neglected tropical disease and pandemic science and COVID-19. He also got more than 50 research publications in index journal. He also serves as a public health expert advisor to Kerala State Disaster Management Authority in the context of COVID-19 and also is a member of core committee for NIPA control. He is also actively involved in people's health movement in Kerala. Uh, I, uh, I welcome you, sir, to the session. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Slide. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. I am very happy to attend this webinar because of many reasons. One major reason is One Health is, a, is something very close to my heart and I am always a student of One Health. And second one is uh, Dr. T. Jayagushin, sir, sir is my teacher and I am very happy to be here in this webinar because of that. And Dr. B. Iqbal is also attending. So that is another matter of pleasure. And uh, we have learned a lot from Arun and Arun is a consultant. We also used to call him for any doubts in One Health. If I understand correctly, he is working with the One Health Institute, proposed One Health Institute of ICMR that may be started in Nagpur. And now it is a part of National Institute of Virology, Pune. So can you share my slides? Yes, sir. Yes. Please put it in the slideshow mode. Yeah, thank you. Next slide. I won't repeat what Dr. Arun has already mentioned. So this is the CDC definition of one health that Dr. Arun has mentioned already. Next slide. Okay, this is something worth mentioning that uh, in 2022, the World Health Day theme for WHO was planetary health. That is very much linked to One Health. And in the context of COVID-19, as rightly pointed by Dr. Arun, and COVID-19 taught many things that uh, Arun was mentioning so many things. But adding to that, it is saying that attempting to save money by neglecting environmental protection, emergency preparedness, health systems, and societal safety has proven to be false economy and the bills is now being paid many times over. If you were able to prevent a spillover, especially that what has happened in Wuhan, how much money would have been saved? Whatever money you are pumping in to save your environment, protect from spillovers and all other things are peanuts compared to the, the emerging uh, environmental and economic impact because of these kinds of pandemic threats and infectious diseases. So that is a very important thing. In Kerala, we have got a notion that uh, we, are, we have actually solved the infectious diseases problem and we are facing the non-communicable disease. It is partly correct that the major morbidity burden is contributed by non-communicable disease, but infectious disease threat is actually a very big emerging things that is going to come in future. So definitely we should have uh, the, a comprehensive approach to address the emerging infectious diseases as well as the emerging other emerging problems like the elderly problem, our non-communicable diseases. Now we have got enough data that breast cancer is emerged as a pandemic. And so the One Health approach is the approach that is suited to for infectious diseases especially, if even if there is so much connection with other problems also, because One Health is something connected to non-communicable diseases also. 
So why this antibiotic resistance? If you think you can understand that, if the, the community is suffering from diabetes, definitely you have to use more diabetes, more antibiotic, and it may uh, is end up in emergence of antibiotic resistance. So it is something very, very uh, interlinked that the, the infectious diseases, non-infectious diseases. If you may, again, if you compare in our infant mortality rate, why our children are dying? A portion of our children are dying because of infectious agents. There is no treatment at all. Our elderly people are dying because of infections, especially pneumonia, without any treatment options at all. So these things are an elderly problem and one health. All these things are actually we have to address in a comprehensive way. So one health, in other sense, it is really one health. That means it is not that you have to include the animal health also to human health. You have to include many aspects of human health together. So there is no distinction between infectious diseases or non-infectious diseases. If you incorporate this also, that is also one health. If you are able to, to detect the health of people residing in urban areas are equal to or it is integrated to the disease of people in rural areas. Because if there is an emergence of disease in the rural area, definitely it will come to the to stick to strike the urban area also. So in that sense, also One Health is very, very important. Next slide. So this is a very important landmark in uh, One Health philosophy that the Wildlife Conservative Society building interdisciplinary bridges to health. There is a meeting, the name of that meeting, they met at uh, Manhattan and it is known as Manhattan Principles. Manhattan's principles is very important in, in studying about One Health. Even what are the options that is left behind is also very important uh, in context of Manhattan principle. So I will just go through. One is what, what Manhattan principle says. So you can just look at the year. It is in 2004, just after the emergence of SARS-1. And uh, we know, we, we knew what what is the way forward? But we neglected all these things. And that may be the reason that we could be paid it back because of COVID-19. So recognizing the link is essential. That is very important. Recognizing the link between uh, man, animal, environment, functioning ecosystems, and all these things are very, very important. So that that as uh, the, the, I think the principle was telling in the, uh, the in introductory remarks, that uh, uh, these things are very, very important that we have to, to understand because every single person has got a role in one health in his day-to-day -day life. So while the second point is wildlife sci health science is essential to global disease prevention, surveillance, monitoring, control, and mitigation. So we have to incorporate the wildlife health also to the human health. That is very, very important. And device adaptive, holistic, and you can just go through the slides. I am not going to detail. Next slide. Okay. In Manhattan principle, it is very important that even in 2004, as Dr. Anand was already mentioned, we were knowing that the importance of this wildlife and bush meat trade, that is a very important thing nowadays. Because you might have heard about stories that people went to forest and they had maybe hunt some animals, wild animals and all. But that is not the case. Now the wild animal hunting is not taking place in forest, but it is actually taking place in the heart of cities. So the wild animals are trafficked to the large cities and it is traded there. If there is a spillover is happening in that particular area, definitely large number of people are infected. That might have happened in Wuhan. So Wuhan is a big city. The total population of Wuhan is some something just half of Kerala, more maybe 1.45 crores, say second biggest city in China. And what is if there is a spillover is happening at the heart of a city, definitely that is a big issue. So the spillover, don't think that it is happening in villages. Actually, it may be happening in the heart of cities. So that is a very important thing that uh, when Manhattan principle was telling even in the, the uh, outset itself. So 
again they are studying about so many things uh, you we have to fully integrate biodiversity con uh, conservation to the perspective of human health that is one thing plastic mass culling of wild species if absolutely necessary okay definitely we can we can cull especially if there is an emerging threat of a high priority pathogen like maybe human or, or avian influenza or a, a wild life is, has turned to be a pe pest that is damaging your economy or something like that without that kind of an evidence there is no mass culling it should be promoted because so many evidences that when in the context of nipa we can see that if you are going to to uh, destroy bats or their habit habitat the chance of spillovers will be more next slide okay so Another principle is enhance the capacity of uh, global human and animal health surveillance and forming collaborative relationship among governments, local board, local people, and private partners, and providing adequate resources and support for global wildlife health surveillance networks. So that now we, we know that the entire world is just like a village. And if the, something is happening in one part of the, the, the globe, Definitely, the tool just just is going to transmit the other part very very soon because of global trade and traffic. And investing, educating, and raising awareness among world's people and influencing the policy process. These are the things. Next slide. These are the things already mentioned in uh, uh, this Manhattan Principle. So, in the context of development perspective, also the One Health is very very important. You know know that we have got eighteen. SDG goals and I was looking one by one I, I and I could hardly found something not related to One Health. So this is something very very much directly involved to One Health just like the principle one that you have to end poverty and hunger because if you just look at the, the, the food of people we can see that the one major chunk of food is contributed by animal meat that is one thing even if you are having your crops or grains, it is largely influenced by climate change and all other things. So just just uh, an example I was taking about uh, food. And again, if you look at any, any form of any kind of uh, SDG goals that you can have, you can see that there is a link between One Health and this particular development perspective. So if that means if you are going to be go for a sustainable development in future, that is also one health is important. As in, we used to say that in community medicine, epidemiology has grown above community medicine, something like that. One health is growing more than the, the thrust that we are given to infectious disease control. Sometimes I think one health is the approach that we can use to, uh, to address all health issues maybe in the world. Next. So I am now I am moving to a very minimalistic approach to One Health. So many things was mentioned by Dr. Arul, and I am not going to repeat that. The human health perspective of One Health include, but not restricted to antimicrobial resistance, zoonotic diseases, and vector-borne diseases. These are the major three areas. So next slide. Oh, AMR, it was also definitely discussed by Dr. Arun, but I, I have to mention two or three points. One thing is, uh, don't think that the AMR has got a direct or a linear relationship with the antibiotic that we use. Because if you are going to create a resistance in a species of, or, a, or in a microbe, uh, definitely the unexposed microbes will also get the ability to persistence against the antibiotic. That is the one thing that you have to remember. So if there is a, a gene that is responsible for an antimicrobial resistance is happened to be in the environment, there is a gene transfer is happening that even the unexposed microbes are also becoming resistant to uh, antimicrobial resistance. So that is a very important point that we have to note. That is one thing. The second one is, uh, as it is, uh, the, the there is because of a selection pressure, that is the term that Adun was using. 
because you are using so much antibiotic so for that context this particular microbe with an antibiotic resistance has got a, a tendency to emerge uh, just like what dr uh, what charles darwin says that there is a survival of the fittest because the environment is full full of antibiotic so if there is an organism which is able to resist antibiotic definitely it will emerge but one advantage of that if you stop antibiotic the selection pressure will go down and definitely the antibiotic this the resistance to a particular antibiotic is no longer an advantage for this particular microbe and it will so it is a reversible as far as we know most often it is a reversible situation so that is one advantage that you have to note and second one is about antimicrobial resistance the human use of antimicrobials are not that much important maybe compared to the use of antibiotic in other especially for animals dr arun mentioned that the, there is no data that about the antibiotic use among poultry in kerala but i have got some anecdotal information i when i was working as a phc medical officer i used to visit poultry farms and have our regular inspection and i found that the chunks of antibiotics are used even in our broilers also uh, so that is something very important that if you are using antibiotic in your broilers or for your dog or your cow that is much more important than you are using an antibiotic by your own because if you use especially human use of antibiotic is right it is something it is regulated even you know that you cannot use antibiotic for more than 5 days or more than 7 days or 14 days whatever it may be and uh, you may not go for an antibiotic without a problem uh, and, and some most often it will be prescribed by a doctor even there is some antibiotic residues are there it may going to a septic tank or some isolated places but if you are using antibiotic for your chicken or broilers definitely it will be the residues are going to the soil often we will collect from the vendors as it is a manure and we will use as a manure for our cultivations so that kind of issues are there so the use of antibiotic is uh, very very important and it is not the human use alone and we are using so many materials which is uh, resembling antibiotics just like your weed seed that we use many people argue that weed seed has got very very similar structure of an antibiotic and even using weed seeds can contribute to antimicrobial resistance so these kinds of issues are emerging and as dr arun has already mentioned antimicrobial resistance is one of the major threat of uh, human health next slide so in kerala uh, we have got maybe in K i may be using so many examples from kerala because as far as uh, the now the kerala is definitely it is going uh, it is a forerunner in one health so if we don't have much data about the, the other part of uh, india i am not going or i am not saying that kerala is doing a wonderful job or something like that but definitely kerala situation is much better you can see four pictures here what you are seeing in the right hand side uppermost part is annual report of kerala antimicrobial resistance surveillance network it is it is the unique one that we maybe we kerala has got old. we we at least we know uh, especially in our medical colleges government medical college yes what are the antibiotics used and among the samples they received what is the resistance pattern at least we know but there is a lot of challenges because it is only for my medical college that is also government medical colleges uh, private uh, hospitals are the major players we do not know what is happening in animal sphere and so all of these things are missing but to start with we have got a system to monitor the antibiotic use and in the right hand side lower part it is uh, from different institutions when from where this data is coming and in the left hand side on the lower part you can see that i, I just put a picture from that particular uh, document that is freely available and we can share if you want uh, and i think it may be available in internet 
So that is a resistance pattern in enterococcus in species that we in 2021. So as a part of Keralium, uh, the chief minister is uh, opening a app that is anti antibiome application uh, also. That is also available for uh, people's use. So the doctors can know about the antibiotic resistance, what are the types of antibiotic resistance that we are facing, what is the current data, and all other things may be available in that particular app. So that is something that the, uh, what we have in uh, about antimicrobial resistance. Next slide. Okay, as I have already mentioned, antimicrobial resistance, don't think that this is an infectious disease issue. AMR and NCDs, because NCD is a major contributor of AMR. And you know that in our elderly population, one of the major reasons for death is antimicrobial resistance. Often people say that, okay, the person is not responding to medicines. Or it is not the, that the person is not responding to an antihypertensive or something. It is just that the person has got a severe pneumonia and we don't have medicine for that. So whenever you just hearing that a person is not responding to medications, you think about a possibility of antimicrobial resistance. And our infant mortality rate in Kerala is somewhere around five or six. Out of the six, five are dying because of very severe diseases, congenital abnormalities. But one child, one baby out of thousand is dying because of an infection where the physician is not able to treat. There may be a reason for that. For example, the, the child may be very sick or sometimes the child may be malnourished. But definitely it is affected by an infectious agent. And so, as Dr. Adundas already mentioned, it is a silent pandemic that is already happening. So that is uh, something that we have to remember about antimicrobial resistance and it is already there. It is already working in us and we have to have our system to prevent or to control the antimicrobial resistance. Otherwise, there is a possibility that there is a possibility of a large pandemic because of some superbugs or sometimes some a complex of superbugs. And if it is not already happening. So, uh, Iqbar sir used to say that uh, it is better to have an outbreak or a pandemic because of a viral disease because at least we have got vaccination. And now our vaccination platforms are very, very strong because of mRNA vaccine and emergence of vector vaccines and all. So it is very easy for us to take care of a viral pandemic. But if it is a bacterial pandemic because of a superbug, definitely the situation will be much worse because uh, the against a bacteria, the, the, the vaccine may not work as good as the against a virus. So that we have to be very concerned about. That is one major problem that we can have, we, we, we are facing. Next. Okay, so not a disease, it is already mentioned by Dr. Arun. I am not going to detail. Next one. Vector-borne diseases are also very, very important. But in zoonotic diseases and vector-borne diseases, uh, it is, uh, we have to, to know that what is happening in Kerala, maybe in, in other part of India also. Again, I am using Kerala as a case study because at least we have got a lot of data from what is happening in Kerala. We have just faced a Nipah and we know that we don't know how the spillover is happening that is there. And in the last time in Keralium seminar, Dr. Jacob T. John was telling about the rabies. In rabies, uh, he was mentioning a very interesting case, I think. Because uh, whenever uh, the animal is dead, the epidemic will not last long. But if the reservoir is not affecting the animal, we, wo we sometimes we won't find out the reservoir and the epidemic may last long. For example, what is the problem or what is the responsible animal for KFT in Kerala? There is a conflict in argument that is it rodents or is it monkeys? So Dr. Anun was just pa mentioning it pa just passively that rodents are also responsible for KFD. But there is an argument that rodents are the major culprit in KFD, but it won't, the virus will not kill rodents. So we are not recognizing rodents as a major culprit. 
monkeys are affected just like humans are affected poor monkeys are dying and maybe because of monkeys death the this particular age or this parasite may or this particular tick may may come in contact with human being and so many issues can happen but the monkey death is noted but what is happening in rodent is not noted similarly in uh, the rabies will kill the animal the dog may be dying within days but we know that why this is occurring uh, progressively every day a dog is affected but the dog is killed most often the dog may not transmit the disease to other dog it is not the because not because of the dog is transmitting the virus to another dog the epidemic among dogs is, is persisting maybe some other host will be there where this particular virus may not be killing the host some other species just like fox or something like that we do not know so one health one issue is we do not exactly know what is happening and so many complexities are there in vaccine for this vector borne diseases there are so many issues that in kerala we are facing not only the regular issues like our dengue and chikungunya even you know what happened to chikungunya chikungunya was a disease which was restricted to some part of africa and uh, what happened in 2006 and 2007 uh, one of the major argument and so many research papers are also there there a mutation was happened in the african lineage of this particular virus that is known as a226v mutation so this particular genome of chikungunya virus in the 226th position the alanin was changed to valin because of a poin mutation only because of that mutation the virus at is was capable of acquiring a huge advantage in survival because suddenly because of a particular mutation in virus the edis albopictus was able to pick the virus more if you just look at the distribution of edis mosquitoes edis albopictus is largely distributed all over the world compared to edis aegypti edis aegypti being the most uh, efficient vector for chikungunya and dengue albopictus was also also it was widely present was also able to pick the virus so that was the reason that there is a large outbreak of chikungunya in 2006 and 2007 and now we are facing a large outbreak of zika virus in kerala in northern part of kerala that you may be knowing in newspapers and other things not only mosquitoes uh, you, you may be knowing that sand flies are transmitting uh, leishmanias so uh, and interesting thing is uh, in according to the classical textbook sand flies are of different species one of the dangerous types of flies is phlebotomus argentipus that is a specific type of sand fly which is transmitting a parasite uh, known as uh, uh i don't what is the name of that parasite uh leishmania donovan okay leishmania donovan leishmania donovan is the uh, parasite and this phlebotomus argentipus is the vector this combination is dangerous because it will uh, transmit visceral leishmaniasis so which is which is a systemic disease and it is a killer disorder but the other combination especially phlebotomus uh, papetasi and leishmania tropica this combination is not that much dangerous because it will transmit only cutaneous leishmaniasis which is just like a cutaneous issue and it is not a life threatening issue but in kerala what we are noticing is that the major chunk of sand flies in kerala is phlebotomus argentipus which is the vector for visceral leishmaniasis and the agent which is responsible for even cutaneous leishmaniasis is leishmania donovan so the agent and vector responsible for the visceral leishmaniasis is by because of some luck it is transmitting a uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis if it is going to transmit uh, visceral leishmaniasis our tribal area will be in big threat not only tribal area because of climate change these particular vectors can be there will be large abundance of this particular vectors in our mainland also 
so many issues are there very much connected to one health sometimes if you just go into the real data it is uh, it is uh, we will be frightened so just like in kft kft you know that this particular vector responsible for kft is hemophilus spinigera which is largely present in on mainland even in our domestic animals in rodents and all this particular thing is already present if there virus is there definitely every one of us can be affected by this particular disease don't think that kft and uh, nipa and all other things are the problem of kerala kerala has got unique problems because it is a, just like a large city located in the midst of forest so we have got the problem with city that is the population migration population density and all other things and again there is a chance of spillover because our climate is just like that of a forest but definitely we have got our own issues but it is the pan indian or a pan global issue that even in india we do not know what is happening but in kerala at least we know a partly things we are not fully aware of these things but at least partial data are available can you just change the slide okay uh, what you are seeing in the left hand side is uh, that of uh, leishmaniasis that I, i was mentioning what you are seeing in the right hand side is kfd and what you are seeing in the upper part is shimoga district where that is the epicenter of kfd and we know that it is there the vayanad vayanad in kerala is very very important because it is very one, one thing is it is a biodiversity hotspot and it has got and so many people argue that the uh, the nilagiri district of tamil nadu it may be an epicenter of all these diseases maybe because of the surveillance issues and maybe because of lower incidence or lower density of population maybe because of system issues that we are not picking issues there in nilagiri district of tamil nadu or in similar uh, situations in other part of india next slide so vector borne diseases definitely it is going to increase we know that because of climate change the temperature humidity and rain for all these things are going to be increase and the vectors are going to take and care of the globe and human animal conflicts are going to be increased because of we now even for example monkeys we are in close proximities with monkeys and the disease can transmit through these kinds of animals land use uh, so is patent has changed the scrub typhus epidemic of kerala is often uh, linked to the land use uh, not only scrub typhus even leptospirosis outbreak is because we have got a lot of false notion about all these diseases even we name the disease for example kfd is known as kurangubani in kerala that means monkey fever leptospirosis is known as rat fever uh, it is giving you a notion that the rats are responsible for leptospirosis but rat may be responsible for leptospirosis partially but in many other part dogs are a major culprit in leptospirosis we go, we have a lot of street dogs and the if you just look at the the urinary urine outcome output the dog has got large urine output and we have got very strong epidemiological data that people we are in close proximity to dogs cattle and all other animals are high risk of having leptospirosis so animal urine contaminated with water is a very important thing but rodents if you just uh, specifically say it is a rodents sometimes you may be in bluffed then insecticide resistance is also very important because of we are facing uh, this uh, vector borne diseases uh, it is not the antimicrobial resistance alone insecticide resistance and the resistance of uh, against malarial drugs and all other things are very very important for us next slide okay so many other direct impacts are also there because of food safety food borne diseases are are on the increase environmental health like just like water pollution air pollution climate change we have got even it is a matter of shame that in kerala we have got recurrent outbreaks of cholera so it is not regularly reported also if when i, I am actually working in manjeri medical college and i know that the last year also we have got a large outbreak of cholera in vadikadu so issues are there food security issues are there because of uh, climate change and 
even this is the internet today this year is international year of uh, small crops like millets so that is actually something good that even if there is a short of rainfall if you can shift to more uh, climate resilient food materials like uh, this millets so so many issues are there connected to one health approach next and so many indirect effects are also there. Uh, if you are able to identify some viruses in bats or in other animals, even there is a lot of uh, infodemics are happening around this particular thing that COVID-19 is a man-made virus. Uh, I do not know whether COVID-19 is a man-made virus or not. Most often it may not be a man-made virus because we have got maybe evidence in favor of it is a natural virus. It has got more strength than that kinds of other kinds of arguments. But is it possible for man to create a virus? That is another question because the template is already there. If you have got a template of coronavirus, you can change the the shape of uh, the the spike protein of a coronavirus. Now the technology is already available, and it is going to develop in future. So. If this, this is a highly uh, important technology, if there is some which is going to be there in the hands of the other groups, even countries can use this, this as a bioweapon. Because if you are using an infectious agent like a weapon, it is very easy because it will only kill human beings. You can just create isolated outbreaks of highly fatal diseases among in, I mean, in, a barracks of soldiers and it is possible without affecting any infrastructure you can kill people so these kinds of things are also emerging and uh, you know that uh, the definitely these kinds of emerging high threat infections are highly linked to social inequ inequities like if you look at the health system ebola is affecting the area where the health system of the country is the lowest or the world is the poorest and the often we fail to detect outbreaks we fail to to control outbreaks if your health system is, is poor so the socio economic vulnerabilities are very important if you don't have a social system in place that is very important because covid 19 is giving you that kind of a picture that sometimes it, the international solidarity won't work. In COVID-19, what happened was the rich countries were just having heaps of vaccines and even poor countries were not even denied vaccine for their health workers. The last day, Dr. Saumya Swaminathan was telling about it is not only of vaccine, the diagnostics, because if you want to detect COVID-19, at least you should have a uh, antigen test but if your country is denied of antigen test and if your country is very poor to have your own antigen test or PCR, how you know that you were affected by COVID-19 or not? So that kind of issue is there. So that is also to be addressed. Next slide. So political and economical dimensions, unequal distribution of economic resources, socioeconomic, spatial and economic vulnerabilities are there. Because if there is a high threat pandemic is there or outbreak is there, it is the low socioeconomic status of people or poor people are going to be affected more. Inequity in access to preventive, diagnostic and therapeutic resources. Infectious diseases are markers of inequity. Often COVID-19 is considered as a litmus test. In Kerala, COVID-19 was affected largely in uh, migrant population. Uh, may not, may, in India, may not, in, not in, in Kerala. In Kerala, it was affected by the coastal area was affected largely by COVID-19. So whenever there is an outbreak or a disease transmission, even the chance of spill over will be more in the population where there is an inequitable distribution of resources. Next slide. Kerala is very important. It is definitely it is a very important lab for one health because of so many reasons. I have listed a few things. One is the biodiversity. Definitely there is chance of spillovers. Human animal conflicts, it's a day-to-day -day affair in Kerala. And dominated by non-vegetarian diet. 
because we are not producers but we are consumers we were investigating a human case of buffalo pox uh, last year and we found that the buffalo there is no checking there is no inspections the buffaloes are are actually uh, we we have the animal at our doorsteps and often we don't have any restrictions how to slaughter these things and all of things so any point of time these kinds of diseases can jump from a domestic animal from human being because of the our non vegetarian diet practice it is not that our non vegetarian diet practice is something bad but actually how we are doing it is something uh, that we have to be raise questions against that nipa and other high impact pathogens are already there our old age population high morbidity and uh, drug consumption pattern that every day we are using antibiotics for different purposes and antibiotic even not only using uh, and dr arun was mentioning that antibiotic once we were using antibiotic as a growth promoter in food materials but even now we are using antibiotic not as a growth promoter but to safeguard our maybe food materials from fermentation or from other uh, kinds of damage so often in our there is a practice that in, even in our super uh, markets the if you if you are going to purchase a meat, meat piece definitely sometimes the meat piece may be covered with a certain antibiotic to retard the multiplication of bacteria so our consumer some immigration and emigration at any point of time we can have a zoonotic diseases to be there because in monkeypox you know that it was uh, to, from gulf countries we are getting the disease very fast the presence of migratory birds is another change especially for the high priority avian influenza is concerned vector borne diseases are and vectors are largely present because of the climate things and vector borne diseases are there if i quote dr ibal it is uh, we uh, we have the yellow fever threat is already there the population density urbanization so many issues are there so can you change the slides this is a, an interesting paper published in lancet in 2014 and they say that uh it is even before covid they published it 2008 and they said there there is a, four types of pandemics can emerge one is it is uh, pathogen from wildlife it is because of a spillover second one is pathogen from domestic animals because that is also very important even in kerala we are noticing so many things even the human diseases are transmitted to animals and animals diseases are transmitted to human so for example tuberculosis if the the papan has got tuberculosis there is a chance that the animal that is the elephant uh, is also yeah, got tuberculosis drug resistant pathogens there is again we have discussed vector borne disease pathogens and the but this particular paper in dancet argued that there are uh, hot spots all over the world and the southern southeast asia is always a hot spot you can just look at the, the picture and you can see that some part of uh, africa and uh, southeast asia is a hot spot for all diseases maybe because of social only social inequalities and second because of the biodiversity and kerala is identified as a hot spot especially western ghat is identified as a hot spot for a pathogen from wildlife as well as a vector borne pathogen so that is the thing that we have to note that even we can have a act as an epicenter for the next outbreak because so much of these particular viruses are rna viruses and from covid 19 we know that rna viruses are, can there can be a large very fast mutation in rna so even our nipa is an rna virus and if there is a what uh, we do not know what is happening inside the bat what is happening if it is having got mutation so we have to to prevent at any cost we have to prevent human infection because if one human body is infected by a rna virus especially if it is a nipa for example the human body will will resist the virus the virus will try to uh, to to go to more and more cells so that is why the virus is behaving virus is infecting more and more cells and your immune mechanism is resisting so sometimes the whole viral copies won't be look alike there will be some changes in the virus so if there is a change in rna 
and it has got a high chance of transmission and if it is going to spill from one person to the other in omicron the context of omicron there is an argument that omicron sometimes it is an animal so the animals were affected by from human being and something has happened inside the animal and that may be the responsible for the emergence of omicron another argument that sometimes an immunocompromised person was affected by the virus because of the the changed immune profile of that person might be having an unusual uh, role on the virus so if nipa is affected by a, a person with an unused or un, unusual immune response we do not know what is going to happen to the rna so if this rna is changed and it is converted to a virus which is trans, just like it is just like uh, our bad dreams something like that but it can happen so the the prevention of outbreaks is very very important uh, in the, so this particular syndromic surveillance for encephalitis is very very important and i think india the whole india has to go to that kind of a level so we don't we think that nipa is not happening in india in other part of india it is a problem with kerala or west bengal it is not the case uh, the you, sometimes you may be able to to see the icmr paper uh, or uh, by gokhale and at all about the uh, the presence of nipa virus in bats all other places in india is also affected by nipa in bats so the detection of these kinds of high threat prior uh, pathogens are also very very important next slide okay we can have different strategies to address this one health one is extensive iec for prevention of spillovers uh, we do not know what are the ch chances of spillovers definitely based on the current evidence we have to move and if there are more evidence definitely we will change our strategies based on that for example for nipa we don't have any evidence that how exactly the spill over but we can just target don't use maybe the uh, fruits bitten by bats don't use the the nectar that is present in banana leaf banana flowers don't use banana leaves without washing for having food and all other things so many things are important so based on the the evidence we have to move and and we have to collect evidence on the way also and early detection of infectious diseases with epidemic pandemic potential is very very important that we have already discussed detection of antibiotic resistance is very important that is what actually kerala is trying to do partnership in controlling amr with different agencies because the major contributor of amr is not actually human beings but because of other sectors that is what that what i believe and hospital waste management is very important because this but if there is uh, some my this antibiotics are going to the soil so that is why we have to be whenever we are using antibiotic it should be, we have to be very responsible for that uh, in kerala we are using doxycycline to prevent leptospirosis death definitely it is important it may be working and doxycycline is a wonder drug but if you are using it in un you uncheck sometimes you may be able to save 100 lives today but in the cost of 10000 lives in future so definitely we have to to be very um, very much uh, responsible for antibiotic use antibiotic stewardship and monitoring health system strengthening is a very very important thing because if your health system is not able to deliver these things definitely you will be a failure and sometimes you may not recognize the outbreaks of disease at all sometimes you may be recognizing uh, it after the start of pandemic the virological and serological surveillance in human and domestic and wild animals are also very important and again our institute of advanced virology and we have got icmr has got a very good system next slide and all other things are very very important but we have to include our whole country at least to the network of this diagnostics and health impact assessment prior to all developmental projects restriction to use of insecticide weedicides and fungicides addressing deforestation and protecting animal habitats including that of bats managing human animal conflicts promotion of vaccination both in animals and humans that is a very very important thing that the infodemic is happening that we is against vaccination but if there is a pandemic especially if the the h5n1 is turned to be a pandemic vaccination is the only thing that is going to help you 
So that trust in vaccination is something that is very important that we have to keep and we have to resist these kinds of infodemic at any cost because the uh, the communication against vaccination is happening at the cost of human life. So it is among animals also it is very important, especially in leptospirosis, which is a massive program is happening in Kerala to, to vaccinate against dogs, but definitely it has to go a lot. The use of protective gears before handling animals or their secretions or excreta is also very important because even in Kerala now, leptospirosis is largely affected in people who are handling animals. Not only the leptospirosis, so many diseases can happen. So promotion of hand hygiene is a very, very important thing. The other thing I have already mentioned, interdepartmental coordination is very, very thing. And even in Kerala, I don't think that is happening in the optimum level. Academic collaborations are also very, very important. We have to speak, we have to think, and we have to discuss. And we have to come out with purpose also. Even research and publications are all important because he, Dr. Aruni is making a presentation and he was sporting a lot of purpose from where he is getting this purpose. Definitely, whenever you are you are you are publishing a document, it is beneficial because the whole world is maybe joining together. So there is a sharing resources is very, very important. Next one. And avoiding handling bats and migratory birds, very, very important. Integrate domestic animal surveillance to human surveillance program is a very important thing. It is, is I think that is going to happen in Kerala because of the World Bank assisted One Health program. Auditing antibiotic usage is very important. Control of infodemic, I have already mentioned. Facilitate research and establishment of systems. Facilitate community engagement programs and training. It's very, very important. We have to tell our people that this is the available evidence and you have to do these things. And uh, training for our doctors. In case of scrub typhus, one of the major reasons for people were dying because of scrub typhus that people, the doctors were not knowing that which is the drug of choice. So that can happen. So training is very important. Ensure the availability of resources, even including research funding. Incorporate One Health into academic curriculum. We have to speak about these things even from our childhood because it is going to go a long way. And ensure in international solidarity to the cause. That is, so again, Dr. Iqbal was always telling about international solidarity. And I would love to hear from him if he is already here in this group. Next one. Next. This is on health movement in Kerala. I, I actually spoke a lot about this in the middle of my lecture. So I think this was the last slide. Next one. Thank you. So I I hope that I didn't take a oh okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the informative talk and sharing your personal experience in Kerala context. Thank you, sir. Uh, next we are overwhelmed to have uh, Dr. Iqbal sir as our participant for the webinar. He uh, he was an eminent personality who chaired Kerala's expert committee on COVID-19. So I wish, uh, sir, to have a few words on the talk about the talk. Uh, actually, I'm traveling and I hope you can hear me. Hope yes, you can sir. hear yes. me. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, these two, two friends of mine, they made very excellent uh, analytical uh, presentation of two papers. In fact, I am, I am personally immensely benefited by these presentations. In fact, I am uh, trying to learn from these two entities. I learned a lot from them, actually. Well, uh, now I think some of the entities who are uh, hearing this presentation should work on this particular topic of one health fund. Health, one world, one health. I think we'll have to change the term one health from this. We have to say one health, one life. That would be a better terminology because uh, there, it has been because the term health has been used. There is a misunderstanding that this is exclusively a health issue. It is not only really a health issue. It, is, it all depends upon the survival of the humanity and also <clears throat> the ecosystem. 
the wild ape etc so the, I, i would rather prefer to call this one health uh, one world one life answer and some of the youngsters who are working on this uh, should further work on this issue uh, make make people aware of this because these are public health experts who are listening to it and therefore if see there should be public in public health so it, it, it should not be reduced to an academic topic alone you have to address the public now i was telling my friends again and again kerala for example has got a high density of uh, public health experts in kerala and most of them are now very active very vocal they are writing they are participating in discussions in fact that was one of the reasons why kerala could manage nipa and covid very effectively because the public health community more than the clinicians i would say the public health community in intervened at the appropriate time uh, they talked to the people they talked to the press they wrote a lot they came up with youtube presentations so that is very important so i am very really proud of this public health experts in kerala maybe so in other states also we have now around 32 medical colleges in all these medical colleges we have got medicine departments where there are these committee uh, public health experts and also we have the medical center for health science studies we have mgh program going on so the other day i was telling the minister health minister the other day in her that you will have to convene a meeting of these public health experts in kerala to address not only this uh, infectious disease issue alone we have the non so called non communicable diseases issue uh, in fact kerala has got double disease burden both the non communicable as well as communicable diseases burden and both act as a vicious circle one complicating the other and therefore i was telling the minister to convene a meeting of all the community medicine department experts to discuss how to tackle the uh, both the disease burden in kerala i think the solution to kerala's health problems should be by the public health experts i am an i am a clinician i am an urologist but now i say thing clinicians to write care has to its own limitations we are very far advanced in writing care but that is not to them enough we have a longevity has increased but the quality of survival is extremely poor so therefore uh, i am very happy that uh, my friend jagdish has organized this he is also very active is writing books articles very vocal very active and uh, i think uh, i see that this this particular webinar i see as a as a clarion call from the public health expert that uh, you are going to address these health issues not only really in kerala but also in other states and i am really benefited by these two presentation every day whenever i write an article i consult either arun or anish and correct my articles because i actually learn from them thank you very much thank you ikbal sir for sharing your thoughts with us so now we have almost come to the end of the sessions so before concluding we are happy to make an announcement with you all we'll be soon organizing another webinar on topic fortification of rice with iron as a solution for anemia what are the evidences by team members of cochrane group of meta analysis hope you all will be joining with us for that as well now i would like to invite dr bindu mohandas professor department of community medicine kmct medical college to deliver word of thanks good evening am i audible yes ma'am respected uh, ceo and executive trustee kmct group of institutions dr km navas sir director of operations and executive trustee dr aisha nasreen madam principal kem city medical college dr vijish vedugopal sir professor and hod department of community medicine kem city medical college dr jay krishnan sir scientist b icmr nib pune dr arun tr sir epidemiologist and public health expert 
and the professor of uh, community medicine government medical college manjeri dr anish ts sir faculty of department of community medicine kmct medical college and all the delegates of this webinar on behalf of community medicine department kmct medical college it is my privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion to all those who have helped us to make this webinar happen i would like to thank first our ceo and executive trustee kmct group of institutions dr k m nawaz sir for giving us the permission wholeheartedly to conduct this national level webinar thank you very much sir i sincerely thank our director of operations and executive trustee dr aisha nasreen madam for supporting us throughout by providing all the necessities that are required in organizing and conducting this webinar thank you madam next i would like to thank our beloved principal dr vijish venugopal sir for all the guidance and encouragement in hosting this webinar thank you sir for all the support i would like to express my sincere appreciation to our distinguished speakers who dedicated their time and expertise in sharing their valuable insights and uh, their uh, presentations were not only informative but also inspiring uh, shedding light on to the interconnectedness of human animal and environmental health we are truly grateful for your contributions and i sincerely thank our speaker dr arun tr sir for accepting our invitation to this webinar as our resource person and uh, educating us about the basic concepts in one health thank you very much sir next i would like to thank dr anish tr sir for wholeheartedly accepting our request for this webinar and enlightening us about the future perspective of one health thank you very much sir with a lot of gratitude and respect i would like to thank our hod dr jay krishnan sir for giving us all the guidance support and encouragement for conducting this webinar and also for all the encouragement in all all our efforts thank you sir i would also like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the staff of community medicine department including the post graduate students as well as the technical and it staff of kmct group of institutions for their tireless efforts in putting together this remarkable webinar all your dedication hard work and meticulous planning for this webinar have played a pivotal role in making this webinar a grand success i would like to acknowledge and express my gratitude to all the participants who have joined with us today from various parts of the world and uh, i would like to have a special mention uh, about the cup comments of uh, dr iqbal sir which had added immense value to the discussions today it made this webinar a vibrant and dynamic platform for knowledge exchange thank you all once again for the participation and all your support and dedication are truly appreciated thank you all have a great evening thank you thank you all thank you ma'am uh, certificate e certificates will be uh, issuing from 8th of november onwards so that's all uh, thank you please fill the feedback form we have shared a link in the chat box also thank you dear participants for your whole hearted participation in the webinar we are expecting the same in our future webinars also thank you good night ये 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 ये